Chapters 18 to 22 of First Love. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. First Love by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnett. Chapter 18. I got up in the morning with a headache. My emotion of the previous day had vanished. It was replaced by a dreary sense of blankness and a sort of sadness I had not known till then, as though something had died in me. "'Why is it you're looking like a rabbit with half its brain removed?' said Lushin on meeting me. At lunch I stole a look first at my father, then at my mother. He was composed as usual. She was, as usual, secretly irritated. I waited to see whether my father would make some friendly remarks to me, as he sometimes did. But he did not even bestow his everyday cold greeting upon me. "'Shall I tell Zinaida all?' I wondered. "'It's all the same, anyway. All is as an end between us.' I went to see her, but told her nothing and indeed I could not even have managed to get a talk with her if I had wanted to. The old princess's son, a cadet of twelve years old, had come from Petersburg for his holidays. Zinaida at once handed her brother over to me. "'Here,' she said, "'my dear Volodya,' it was the first time she had used this pet name to me, "'is a companion for you. His name is Volodya, too.' Please like him. He is still shy, but he has a good heart. Show him Neskuchny Gardens, go walks with him. Take him under your protection. You'll do that, won't you? You're so good, too." She laid both her hands affectionately on my shoulders, and I was utterly bewildered. The presence of this boy transformed me, too, into a boy. I looked in silence at the cadet, who stared as silently at me. Zinaida laughed and pushed us towards each other. "'Embrace each other, children!' We embraced each other. "'Would you like me to show you the garden?' I inquired of the cadet. "'If you please,' he replied in the regular cadet's hoarse voice. Zinaida laughed again. I had time to notice that she had never had such an exquisite colour in her face before. I set off with the cadet. There was an old-fashioned swing in our garden. I sat him down on the narrow plank seat and began swinging him. He sat rigid in his new little uniform of stout cloth with its broad gold braiding, and kept tight hold of the cords. "'You'd better unbutton your collar,' I said to him. "'It's all right, we're used to it,' he said, and cleared his throat. He was like his sister. The eyes especially recalled her. I liked being nice to him, and at the same time an aching sadness was gnawing at my heart. "'Now I certainly am a child,' I thought. "'But yesterday—' I remembered where I had dropped my knife the night before and looked for it. The cadet asked me for it, picked a thick stalk of wild parsley, cut a pipe out of it, and began whistling. Othello whistled too. But in the evening how he wept, this Othello, in Zinaida's arms, when seeking him out in a corner of the garden she asked him why he was so depressed. My tears flowed with such violence that she was frightened. "'What is wrong with you? What is it, Volodya?' she repeated. And seeing I made no answer, and did not cease weeping, she was about to kiss my wet cheek. But I turned away from her, and whispered through my sobs, "'I know all. Why did you play with me? What need had you of my love?' "'I am to blame, Volodya,' said Zinaida. "'I am very much to blame.' she added, wringing her hands. "'How much there is bad and black and sinful in me! But I'm not playing with you now. I love you. You don't even suspect why and how. 
But what is it you know? What could I say to her? She stood facing me and looked at me, and I belonged to her altogether from head to foot directly she looked at me. A quarter of an hour later I was running races with the cadet and Zinaida. I was not crying, I was laughing, though my swollen eyelids dropped a tear or two as I laughed. I had Zinaida's ribbon round my neck for a cravat, and I shouted with delight whenever I succeeded in catching her round the waist. She did just as she liked with me. Chapter 19 I should be in a great difficulty if I were forced to describe exactly what passed within me in the course of the week after my unsuccessful midnight expedition. It was a strange feverish time, a sort of chaos, in which the most violently opposed feelings, thoughts, suspicions, hopes, joys and sufferings whirled together in a kind of hurricane. I was afraid to look into myself. If a boy of sixteen ever can look into himself, I was afraid to take stock of anything. I simply hastened to live through every day till evening, and at night I slept. The light-heartedness of childhood came to my aid. I did not want to know whether I was loved, and I did not want to acknowledge to myself that I was not loved. My father I avoided. But Zinaida I could not avoid. I burnt as in a fire in her presence, and what did I care to know what the fire was in which I burned and melted? It was enough that it was sweet to burn and melt. I gave myself up to all my passing sensations, and cheated myself, turning away from memories and shutting my eyes to what I foreboded before me. This weakness would not most likely have lasted long in any case. A thunderbolt cut it all short in a moment, and flung me into a new track altogether. Coming in one day to dinner from a rather long walk, I learnt with amazement that I was to dine alone, that my father had gone away, and my mother was unwell, did not want any dinner, and had shut herself up in her bedroom. From the faces of the footmen, I surmised that something extraordinary had taken place. I did not dare to cross-examine them, but I had a friend in the young waiter, Philippe, who was passionately fond of poetry and a performer on the guitar. I addressed myself to him. From him I learned that a terrible scene had taken place between my father and mother, and every word had been overheard in the maid's room. Much of it had been in French, but Masha, the lady's maid, had lived five years with a dressmaker from Paris, and she understood it all. That my mother had reproached my father with infidelity, with an intimacy with the young lady next door. That my father at first had defended himself, but afterwards had lost his temper, and he too had said something cruel. Reflecting on her age, which had made my mother cry. That my mother too had alluded to some loan which it seemed had been made to the old princess, and had spoken very ill of her and of the young lady too, and that then my father had threatened her. And all the mischief, continued Philippe, came from an anonymous letter, and who wrote it no one knows, or else there'd have been no reason whatever for the matter to have come out at all. But was there really any ground? I brought out with difficulty, while my hands and feet went cold, and a sort of shudder ran through my inmost being. Philippe winked meaningly. There was. There's no hiding those things. For all that your father was careful this time. But there, you see, he'd, for instance, to hire a carriage or something. No getting on without servants, either. I dismissed Philippe and fell onto my bed. I did not sob, I did not give myself up to despair. I did not ask myself when and how this had happened. I did not wonder how it was I had not guessed it before long ago. I did not even upbraid my father. What I had learnt was more than I could take in. This sudden revelation stunned me. 
all was at an end. All the fair blossoms of my heart were roughly plucked at once, and lay about me flung on the ground, and trampled underfoot. CHAPTER Twenty. My mother next day announced her intention of returning to the town. In the morning my father had gone into her bedroom, and stayed there a long while alone with her. No one had overheard what he said to her, but my mother wept no more. She regained her composure, and asked for food, but did not make her appearance nor change her plans. I remember I wandered about the whole day, but did not go into the garden. I never once glanced at the lodge, and in the evening I was the spectator of an amazing occurrence. My father conducted Count Malevsky by the arm through the dining-room into the hall, and in the presence of a footman said icily to him, A few days ago your excellency was shown the door in our house, and now I am not going to enter into any kind of explanation with you, but I have the honour to announce to you that if you ever visit me again I shall throw you out of window. I don't like your handwriting. The Count bowed, bit his lips, shrank away, and vanished. Preparations were beginning for our removal to town, to Arbati Street, where we had a house. My father himself probably no longer cared to remain at the country house, but clearly he had succeeded in persuading my mother not to make a public scandal. Everything was done quietly, without hurry. My mother even sent her compliments to the old princess, and expressed her regret that she was prevented by indisposition from seeing her again before her departure. I wandered about like one possessed, and only longed for one thing, for it all to be over as soon as possible. One thought I could not get out of my head. How could she, a young girl, and a princess too, after all, bring herself to such a step, knowing that my father was not a free man, and having an opportunity of marrying, for instance, Bielovzorov? What did she hope for? How was it she was not afraid of ruining her whole future? Yes, I thought, this is love, this is passion, this is devotion. And Lushin's words came back to me. To sacrifice oneself for some people is sweet. I chanced somehow to catch sight of something white in one of the windows of the lodge. Can it be Zinaida's face, I thought. Yes, it really was her face. I could not restrain myself. I could not part from her without saying a last good-bye to her. I seized a favourable instant and went into the lodge. In the drawing-room the old princess met me with her usual slovenly and careless greetings. "'How's this, my good man? Your folks are off in such a hurry,' she observed, thrusting snuff into her nose. I looked at her and a load was taken off my heart. The word loan, dropped by Philippe, had been torturing me. She had no suspicion, at least I thought so then. Zinaida came in from the next room, pale and dressed in black, with her hair hanging loose. She took me by the hand without a word, and drew me away with her. "'I heard your voice,' she began, and came out at once. Is it so easy for you to leave us, bad boy? I have come to say good-bye to you, princess, I answered, probably for ever. You have heard perhaps we are going away. Zinaida looked intently at me. Yes, I have heard. Thanks for coming. I was beginning to think I should not see you again. Don't remember evil against me. I have sometimes tormented you, but all the same I am not what you imagine me." She turned away and leaned against the window. Really, I am not like that. I know you have a bad opinion of me. I? Yes, you, you. I, I repeated mournfully, and my heart throbbed as of old under the influence of her overpowering, indescribable fascination. 
I, believe me, Zinaida Alexandrovna, whatever you did, however you tormented me, I should love and adore you to the end of my days. She turned with a rapid motion to me, and flinging wide her arms embraced my head, and gave me a warm and passionate kiss. God knows whom that long farewell kiss was seeking, but I eagerly tasted its sweetness. I knew that it would never be repeated. Goodbye, goodbye, I kept saying. She tore herself away and went out. And I went away. I cannot describe the emotion with which I went away. I should not wish it ever to come again. But I should think myself unfortunate had I never experienced such an emotion. We went back to town. I did not quickly shake off the past. I did not quickly get to work. My wound slowly began to heal. But I had no ill feeling against my father. On the contrary, he had, as it were, gained in my eyes. Let psychologists explain the contradiction as best they can. One day I was walking along a boulevard, and to my indescribable delight I came across Lucian. I liked him for his straightforward and unaffected character, and besides he was dear to me for the sake of the memories he aroused in me. I rushed up to him. Ah, he said, knitting his brows, so it's you, young man. Let me have a look at you. You're still as yellow as ever, but yet there's not the same nonsense in your eyes. You look like a man, not a lapdog. That's good. Well, what are you doing? Working? I gave a sigh. I did not like to tell a lie, while I was ashamed to tell the truth. Well, never mind, Lushin went on. Don't be shy. The great thing is to lead a normal life and not be the slave of your passions. What do you get if not? Wherever you are carried by the tide. It's all a bad lookout. A man must stand on his own feet if he can get nothing but a rock to stand on. Here I've got a cough. And Bielovzorov, have you heard anything of him? No, what, what is it? He's lost, and no news of him. They say he's gone away to the Caucasus. A lesson to you, young man, and it's all from not knowing how to part in time, to break out of the net. You seem to have got off very well. Mind you don't fall into the same snare again. Goodbye. I shan't, I thought. I shan't see her again. But I was destined to see Zinaida once more. Chapter 21 My father used every day to ride out on horseback. He had a splendid English mare, a chestnut piebald, with a long slender neck and long legs, an inexhaustible and vicious beast. Her name was Electric. No one could ride her except my father. One day he came up to me in a good humour, a frame of mind in which I had not seen him for a long while. He was getting ready for his ride, and had already put on his spurs. I began entreating him to take me with him. "'We'd much better have a game of leapfrog,' my father replied. "'You'll never keep up with me on your cob.' "'Yes, I will. I'll put on spurs too.' "'All right, come along then.' We set off. I had a shaggy black horse, strong and fairly spirited. It is true it had to gallop its utmost when Electric went at full trot, still I was not left behind. I have never seen any one ride like my father. He had such a fine, carelessly easy seat that it seemed that the horse under him was conscious of it and proud of its rider. We rode through all the boulevards, reached the maiden's field, jumped several fences. At first I had been afraid to take a leap, but my father had a contempt for cowards, and I soon ceased to feel fear. Twice crossed the river Moskva, and I was under the impression that we were on our way home, especially as my father, of his own accord, observed that my horse was tired. 
when suddenly he turned off away from me at the Crimean ford and galloped along the river bank. I rode after him. When he had reached a high stack of old timber, he slid quickly off electric, told me to dismount, and giving me his horse's bridle, told me to wait for him there at the timber stack, and turning off into a small street, disappeared. I began walking up and down the river bank, leading the horses, and scolding Electric, who kept pulling, shaking her head, snorting and neighing as she went. And when I stood still, never failed to paw the ground, and whining, bite my cob on the neck. In fact, she conducted herself altogether like a spoilt thoroughbred. My father did not come back. A disagreeable damp mist rose from the river. A fine rain began softly blowing up, and spotting with tiny dark flecks the stupid grey timber stack which I kept passing and repassing, and was deadly sick of by now. I was terribly bored, and still my father did not come. A sort of sentry-man, a fin, grey all over like the timber, and with a huge old-fashioned shako like a pot on his head, and with a hall-bird, however came a sentry, if you think of it, on the banks of the Moskva, drew near, and turning his wrinkled face, like an old woman's, towards me, he observed, "'What are you doing here with the horses, young master? Let me hold them.' I made him no reply. He asked me for tobacco. To get rid of him, I was in a fret of impatience, too. I took a few steps in the direction in which my father had disappeared, then walked along the little street to the end, turned the corner, and stood still. In the street, forty paces from me, at the open window of a little wooden house, stood my father, his back turned to me. He was leaning forward over the window-sill, and in the house, half hidden by a curtain, sat a woman in a dark dress talking to my father. This woman was Zinaida. I was petrified. This, I confess, I had never expected. My first impulse was to run away. My father will look round, I thought, and I am lost. But a strange feeling, a feeling stronger than curiosity, stronger than jealousy, stronger even than fear, held me there. I began to watch. I strained my ears to listen. It seemed as though my father were insisting on something. Zinaida would not consent. I seemed to see her face now, mournful, serious, lovely, and with an inexpressible impress of devotion, grief, love, and a sort of despair. I can find no other word for it. She uttered monosyllables, not raising her eyes, simply smiling, submissively, but without yielding. By that smile alone I should have known my Zinaida of old days. My father shrugged his shoulders and straightened his hat on his head, which was always a sign of impatience with him. Then I caught the words, Vous devez vous séparer de cette... Zinaida sat up and stretched out her arm. Suddenly, before my very eyes, the impossible happened. My father suddenly lifted the whip, with which he had been switching the dust off his coat, and I heard a sharp blow on that arm, bare to the elbow. I could scarcely restrain myself from crying out, while Zinaida shuddered, looked without a word at my father and slowly raising her arm to her lips, kissed the streak of red upon it. My father flung away the whip, and running quickly up the steps, dashed into the house. Zinaida turned round, and with outstretched arms and downcast head, she too moved away from the window. My heart sinking with panic, with a sort of awestruck horror, I rushed back, and running down the lane, almost letting go my hold of electric, went back to the bank of the river. I could not think clearly of anything. 
I knew that my cold and reserved father was sometimes seized by fits of fury, and all the same I could never comprehend what I had just seen. But I felt at the time that however long I lived I could never forget the gesture, the glance, the smile of Zinaida. That her image, this image so suddenly presented to me, was imprinted for ever on my memory. I stared vacantly at the river, and never noticed that my tears were streaming. She is beaten, I was thinking. Beaten. Beaten. Hello, what are you doing? Give me the mare, I heard my father's voice saying behind me. Mechanically I gave him the bridle. He leapt on to electric. The mare, chill with standing, reared on her haunches, and leapt ten feet away. But my father soon subdued her. He drove the spurs into her side and gave her a blow on the neck with his fist. Ah, I've no whip, he muttered. I remembered the swish and fall of the whip heard so short a time before, and shuddered. "'Where did you put it?' I asked my father, after a brief pause. My father made no answer, and galloped on ahead. I overtook him. I felt that I must see his face. "'Were you bored waiting for me?' he muttered through his teeth. "'A little. Where did you drop your whip?' I asked again. My father glanced quickly at me. "'I didn't drop it,' he replied. "'I threw it away.' He sank into thought and dropped his head. And then, for the first and almost for the last time, I saw how much tenderness and pity his stern features were capable of expressing. He galloped on again, and this time I could not overtake him. I got home a quarter of an hour after him. "'That's love,' I said to myself again, as I sat at night before my writing-table on which books and papers had begun to make their appearance. That's passion. To think of not revolting, of bearing a blow from any one whatever, even the dearest hand. But it seems one can if one loves. While I, I imagined. I had grown much older during the last month, and my love, with all its transports and sufferings, struck me myself as something small and childish and pitiful beside this other unimagined something which I could hardly fully grasp, and which frightened me like an unknown, beautiful but menacing face which one strives in vain to make out clearly in the half-darkness. A strange and fearful dream came to me that same night. I dreamed I went into a low, dark room. My father was standing with a whip in his hand, stamping with anger. In the corner crouched Zinaida, and not on her arm but on her forehead was a stripe of red, while behind them both towered Bielosvorov, covered with blood. He opened his white lips and wrathfully threatened my father. Two months later I entered the university, and within six months my father died of a stroke in Petersburg, where he had just moved with my mother and me. A few days before his death he received a letter from Moscow which threw him into a violent agitation. He went to my mother to beg some favour of her, and I was told he positively shed tears. He, my father! On the very morning of the day when he was stricken down, he had begun a letter to me in French. My son, he wrote to me, fear the love of woman, fear that bliss, that poison. After his death my mother sent a considerable sum of money to Moscow. Chapter 22 Four years passed. I had just left the university, and did not know exactly what to do with myself, at what door to knock. I was hanging about for a time with nothing to do. One fine evening I met Maidanov at the theatre. 
He had got married, and had entered the civil service. But I found no change in him. He fell into ecstasies in just the same superfluous way, and just as suddenly grew depressed again. "'You know,' he told me, among other things, "'Madame Dolsky's here. What Madame Dolsky? Can you have forgotten her? The young Princess Azyekin, whom we were all in love with, and you too. Do you remember at the country house near Neskuchny Gardens? She married a Dolsky. Yes. And is she here in the theatre? No, but she's in Petersburg. She came here a few days ago. She's going abroad. What sort of fellow is her husband? I asked. A splendid fellow with property. He's a colleague of mine in Moscow. You can well understand, after the scandal. You must know all about it. Meidanov smiled significantly. It was no easy task for her to make a good marriage. There were consequences, but with her cleverness everything is possible. Go and see her. She'll be delighted to see you. She's prettier than ever. Meidanov gave me Zinaida's address. She was staying at the Hotel Demut. Old memories were astir within me. I determined next day to go to see my former flame. But some business happened to turn up. A week passed, and then another. And when at last I went to the Hotel Demut and asked for Madame Dolsky, I learnt that four days before she had died, almost suddenly, in childbirth. I felt a sort of stab at my heart. The thought that I might have seen her, and had not seen her, and should never see her, that bitter thought stung me with all the force of overwhelming reproach. She is dead, I repeated, staring stupidly at the hall porter. I slowly made my way back to the street, and walked on without knowing myself where I was going. All the past swam up and rose at once before me. So this was the solution. This was the goal to which that young, ardent, brilliant life had striven, all haste and agitation. I mused on this. I fancied those dear features, those eyes, those curls, in the narrow box, in the damp underground darkness lying here, not far from me, while I was still alive, and maybe a few paces from my father. I thought all this. I strained my imagination, and yet all the while the lines, from lips indifferent of her death I heard, indifferently I listened to it too, were echoing in my heart. O oh, youth, youth! Little dost thou care for anything. Thou art master, as it were, of all the treasures of the universe. Even sorrow gives thee pleasure. Even grief thou canst turn to thy profit. Thou art self-confident and insolent. Thou sayest, I alone am living, look you. But thy days fly by all the while, and vanish without trace or reckoning and everything in thee vanishes like wax in the sun, like snow. And perhaps the whole secret of thy charm lies not in being able to do anything, but in being able to think thou wilt do anything, lies just in thy throwing to the winds forces which thou couldst not make other use of, in each of us gravely regarding himself as a prodigal, gravely supposing that he is justified in saying, Oh, what might I not have done if I had not wasted my time? I know, what did I hope for, what did I expect, what rich future did I foresee, when the phantom of my first love, rising up for an instant, barely called forth one sigh, one mournful sentiment, and what has come to pass of all I hoped for? And now, when the shades of evening begin to steal over my life, what have I left fresher, more precious than the memories of the storm so soon over, of early morning, of spring? 
but i do myself injustice even then in those light-hearted young days i was not deaf to the voice of sorrow when it called upon me to the solemn strains floating to me from beyond the tomb i remember a few days after i heard of zinaida's death i was present through a peculiar irresistible impulse at the death of a poor old woman who lived in the same house as we covered with rags lying on hard boards with a sack under her head she died hardly and painfully her whole life had been passed in the bitter struggle with daily want she had known no joy had not tasted the honey of happiness one would have thought surely she would rejoice at death at her deliverance her rest but yet as long as her decrepit body held out as long as her breast still heaved in agony under the icy hand weighing upon it until her last forces left her the old woman crossed herself and kept whispering lord forgive my sins and only with the last spark of consciousness vanished from her eyes the look of fear of horror of the end and i remember that then by the deathbed of that poor old woman i felt aghast for zinaida and longed to pray for her for my father and for myself end of chapter 22 recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey End of First Love by Ivan Turgenev Translated by Constance Garnett